Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to this video. One hour video, full length. I cut out a couple parts to keep it flowing. But for the most part, you'll see everything I did in this painting. Uh, please bear with me. This is raw, unedited audio of a voiceover. So, like I said, bear with me. Because it's a lot of work to edit a voiceover, a video, cut out all the ums and ahs and all that stuff. So, let's proceed. So this is the second of four pieces that I did for a realtor. They were commission jobs. His client purchased four condo buildings and uh, these paintings were the gift that the, um, the realtor gifted to the buyer, his client. And uh, sorry, these are going in the lobbies of the condos, the four paintings. So this is the second one. Uh, of the four so okay so in this case or okay let's just start talking about the first the, what I'm doing right now so what I'm doing right now is just it's called there's a couple different terminologies for it. the underpainting is probably the most common one I refer to them as layers it doesn't really matter it's the first layer it's the underpainting it's just to get some paint on the canvas to block it in um, so as much as this stage it, it doesn't really it doesn't really matter. It, it'll still kind of show through in terms of like what pattern you're going for. You don't necessarily have to have a pattern. Like in my case, I wanted to do this like little curvy thing that you see there with the purple. And I wanted to make the colors sort of follow along, uh, follow along for the, for the underpainting. But as you'll see in the finished piece, like it doesn't really matter. Depending on the amount of detail, of course, like sometimes people put people just kind of put one layer and they just put a lot of detail into that one layer then of course your underpainting be kind that becomes kind of like your your main coat if you will so then in that case you'll see um you'll see a lot of the underpainting but in my case i i put a ton of layers on so in most of the time you 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 cut you you see it but it's not really apparent it's kind of like it's kind of like an afterthought but it's still there so in any case um I put some white there on the outside. I don't know if you uh, if you could see it. It blends in quite well with the canvas, of course. But the white is just to mute the colors down because those colors are pretty saturated. So I wanted to have like a more muted underpainting because I wanted to put some neon colors on this one. So I wanted the neon colors to really shine through. So it it's of course if there's randomness with the brush strokes, but the composition itself is intended in the sense that you you have a plan from the beginning and i mean if it's always best to have a plan to develop a plan from the beginning because then when you're painting you can worry less about the composition and more about actually painting and you'll see better results um yeah so just getting i love the yellow and the i think that's magenta next to it i think that's it's it got mixed in there i can't really i don't remember what to what color out of the tube it was but anyways the yellow and the the, the magenta next to each other I love the orange that uh, it produces when blended it's mesmerizing all right so like I'm not sure if I told you guys I'm not going to be talking the whole time there's music in the background also so there's no mic issues or there's no audio issues if I stopped talking. But uh, yeah, okay, so let's just keep talking about a couple of things here. So composition. Um, composition basically is how your piece is going to look on the aggregate as a whole. Like when you're looking at the piece when it's finished, what is the composition going to look like? Like for example, when you're looking at a landscape painting, the composition might be like they have a really bright background with a really dark foreground or the opposite. Like that'll be the composition. Like right away when you look at it for the first few seconds, what strikes your eye, that's what's referred to as the composition. It's a very important component to any painting, whether it be abstract, portrait, or landscape, because it sort of is the foundation on which you are building for the whole time. I mean, you can sort of wing it, as you gain experience, but I've noticed that the the more prepared I am and the more carefully uh, planned out everything is, the the better the result seems to be. I mean, of course, it's not a it's not a hard set rule, but generally speaking, I find that the more preparation 
that I have with how I'm going to do my layers, not necessarily how I control my brush strokes, but just how the layers are going to look, the better the result is going to be. So, and that's related to composition. So it's kind of, it, these are things you want to think about before. So things in your composition that you can think about are <clears throat> the placement, the placement of objects, like where things are going to be, the colors you're going to be using, the color contrasts that are going to be occurring based on the colors you've chosen. And lastly, but certainly not least important, is the values, the, co the, um, the light values that you're going to be using in your composition, which at some point I'll tell you about those things in the video. I mean, I guess we may as well talk about values right now. So values have to do with the light that is reflecting off of an object. So <clears throat> both extremes of the spectrum are, are com uh, complete white and complete darkness. So light and dark rather, white and dark, or white and black on the color spectrum. So when, when an object is completely white as a result of it being completely illuminated, it's considered to have a value of 100%. And if it's at 0%, then it's complete darkness. So you, in theory, you, or in, in practice, you don't see it against any other objects because there is no light whatsoever being reflected off of it. Perfect examples when you look in space, right? If there's no source of light. So you can have many different colors within the same hue. So the hue refers just to the name of the color. So you have blue hues, green hues, yellow hues, red hues, etc. But within those hues, you have different values. So the more light you add to the hue, so if you just take like that purple there, for example, in the middle, at the very center, it's the darkest. And then as it goes out, it becomes lighter. So it's the same hue, but because I've added white, the value is lighter. So these are things that you want to consider when you're doing your composition or when you're thinking of your composition, because despite you using different hues, like if you use a red and a blue hue and a pink hue and a yellow hue, they're all different. And on the surface, it may appear like, oh, they're completely different colors. It's okay. And they're going to contrast very well. But if you use the same values for each of the colors, they won't contrast very well. So colors don't necessarily contrast. It's more about the values in those colors that contrast. So depending on the shade of green and the shade of red, which is the complementary color of green that you choose, they may not necessarily contrast that well if they don't, if you haven't chosen the right values or if the right values aren't present. So the values that you choose for your painting are relatively important. And there's a lot of good examples of this online if you just Google it. Um, <clears throat> and the way that you would know if the values are correct with a painting, I mean, with abstract, it's, 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 more subject to interpretation because it's abstract, but like in a landscape painting or in a portrait painting, you want to make sure that there's a good, I mean, I guess it's the same thing for abstract. You want to make sure there's a good balance between light and dark. Yeah, actually, I should say it's the same thing in abstract. You want to make sure there's a good balance between light and dark. <clears throat> um, so, and the way that you can do that is when you put your photo in a photo editor and you, I don't know what the option is called, but you do the black and white option and you remove all the colors. If the values are correct, you, you should see a lot of contrast in the black and white. But when you have all the same values, it's just going to be one shade of gray and or one shade of white or black, one shade of black or gray or whatever on the grayscale. So you'll see that as soon as you go, as you put it in black and white. So I suggest you, well, I mean, if this interests you, try it with one of your own paintings, put it in a photo editing app. It's super easy. Uh, you can download Photo P. It's a free editor and it's in two steps. You go image, um, black, uh, transform black and white, and then you go reduce, or actually no, just, yeah, just one option. Just uh, transform black and white. Anyways. So yeah, so you want to choose the right value. So like, for example, in this case, the blue that goes around, like you can see there's lighter values it, in all over the painting because of the white that I added. So I chose a, that blue, that ultramarine blue, because it's transparent and I wanted it to shine through, but also I wanted to have a different values so that it contrasted against the lighter values in the painting. 
So even though like that green and that blue, they're one could think that they're similar in terms of the way that they look, they're they're not because they have different values. The green is much lighter than the blue, and same with the other colors, so that's why it contrasts. And it kind of looks like another. And I, I wanted to do this just to give you some insight as to why I like putting these borders a lot of times. I like putting borders around the paintings. I find it adds another layer because what I'm going to do, as you'll see later, is I'm going to add other stuff on top that comes from the edge of the painting. So it kind of looks like there'll be three layers. There'll be the underpainting, the blue edge, and then there'll be other stuff on top of that. <clears throat> and because of like the difference in the middle, there's like dark and there's all sorts of like light and dark values within the underpainting that in and of itself gives the illusion of depth. So then when you add more um, objects on top of that, it just gives more depth to the painting. So that's all part of the composition. This is how you build your composition. You kind of figure out what you want to do. You don't have to do it this way. You don't have to add layers upon layers, but you definitely need to give some thought to how you want your composition to look uh, in the end. And as you get better, you can sort of go on the fly, like I was saying. But if you're starting out, it definitely is super, super helpful. In fact, I would say is uh, critical to your learning. So there I'm just adding more blue just to darken the very edge of the painting, just to give it the illusion of contour or contouring on the edge there, just more depth. So the one thing about abstract that I notice a lot online is that I, I find a lot of, I find people don't invest much time into it and they kind of get disappointed or discouraged very quickly. Um, like if you were to just look at the underpa underpainting here, I mean, <clears throat> it's pretty cool, but it doesn't really, it's not a finished piece, right? There's, there's missing some stuff. So if I were to stop there and just be like, yeah, it's not good. You know, I don't want to keep doing this. It's no fun. But you have to trust the creative process and you really just have to keep working it. If you don't think it looks good, just keep working it. Keep adding keep adding layers to it, but give it some thought. Don't just randomly add stuff just to add it because what you'll end up with is just a big blob of random paint that doesn't really make any sense. So just give it some thought and uh, don't get discouraged and just keep, keep layering. So here I just added some triangles. This is why I called it fractals. Everything is kind of random in the in the sense that they're not the triangles aren't symmetrical. Uh, symmetrical. I can't remember what the if you know what the terminology without googling it. You can't cheat. No, no cheating. No googling um, for an for triangles with uneven sides. Can't remember the name for that. But anyways, I wanted to do that. Maybe with the exception of that one in the top right corner. But for the most part, you can see they don't meet in the very center. So I wanted to kind of look like those. What do you call them? Stalagmites or stalactites. I think that's what they're called. Those rocks that grow in the caverns there over gazillions of years. So those are, I believe, I'm not sure if they're all neon colors, but oh no, they're not. Actually, that's emerald green. Yeah, that's not uh, that's not a neon color. But in any case, they'll be added at some point, or some of them have already been added. The yellow over there. But yeah, so just working the paint in the canvas here taking my time getting rid of those brush strokes i'm this is called glazing okay so that's another element that's something i like to do personally and i, I made a quick reel on instagram about that glazing so glazing is the act of putting thin layers of paint on a canvas so that the layer beneath it shows through but further to that point there are colors that are more transparent than others. Uh, and don't be deceived in thinking light colors are transparent and dark colors are opaque. In fact, ironically, a lot of dark colors are transparent, a lot of light colors are opaque. So make sure you read the label, but also brand, different brands of paint will be, will have different levels of opacity. Is it, op yeah, opacity, depending on the color and all sorts of things. So just check the tube, play around with it. But there should be an indicator on the tube that tells you whether or not it's transparent or semi-opaque or opaque. But for the glazing process of these triangles, the fractals, I took all transparent colors. So because I, it's something I like doing, I've gotten to know these transparent colors very well. So, I, <clears throat> so I, I kind of, I know how they interact with one another. So I, I chose specific colors for specific areas of the painting based on what colors were present in the underpainting, right? So, um, yeah, those are all transparent colors. Like you've got emerald green there, you've got a crimson red, you've got 
uh, neon yellow, and then the brilliant magenta, and then that there I think is orange or neon orange. It's one of the two. I think it's just regular orange. Either way, I use all the transparent colors. So the transparency of the paint is not something that the manufacturers decide willingly. That's something that the pigment in nature that they use for the color decides. So depending on the pigment that they use and actually the quality of the paint also, um, so the pigment will determine how transparent or opaque it is. So it's completely random. They don't strategically decide to make one more transparent than the other. So it is what it is in that sense. But from what I found, there's quite a large range of colors that are transparent. There are some that aren't like there's no I don't there are no browns. I haven't seen any browns that are transparent. Um, there aren't many blues. There's one blue that I found. And even that the one blue that you see on the edge there, the ultramarine blue, it's it's the least transparent of all of them. It's still transparent, but there aren't any other blues that are transparent. Um, so, yeah. <clears throat> Just getting some triangles on there, having some fun with it. I was gonna only put the four, then I'm like, no, I wanna put like a whole bunch on there. And then it's like each triangle is gonna add different other triangles as they connect with the triangles. So even though I might put like 10 or 12 triangles, it ends up uh, creating like an extra 20 or something. So there'll be like 30 or 40 or maybe 50, who knows, a whole bunch of them. Yeah, that's a neon orange right there, I think. Anyways. So see, as you see that, like, the top of the orange triangle goes over the green there, it's those two shades mixed together, and it makes for, like, a really dark... It basically, they're, they're more or less complementary, those two colors, so it makes kind of like a darkish brown, if you will. But that's the whole point of glazing, is you get all these different effects and different colors as the... Uh, paints interact with one another keep in mind those are dry I, I let it dry in between um, of course to put the masking tape on otherwise paint would be gone there's another yellow not a lot of yellows too there's only I think deep yellow I think it's a deep yellow in the brand that I use anyways not many yellows that are transparent Oh no, that's vermilion. That's what that color is. That's vermilion and the other color is orange. Yeah, they kind of look similar, but vermilion's a little bit darker. That was brilliant magenta. Pretty cool. All right, so I think we got one more layer. Yeah, that's the neon orange right there. All right, that's right. I finished it off with the neon colors. That's right. Yeah, this is the last layer of triangles here. Fractals. Don't be afraid to try things, okay? Um, <clears throat> there's one thing I learned that painting, a lot of people don't give themselves enough credit for, here's the thing, like innately some people are more creative than others, but creativity is definitely a, um, a, a quality or talent or competency, whatever you want to call it, um, a trait, I guess it's a trait that can be worked on, like micro habits, right? So if you think you're not creative, well, the first thing I would say is reframe that mindset. If you want to be creative, that is, if you want to be, I mean, if you have no interest in being creative, then you know, not only are you not, you don't want to be creative, so there's no point expo exploring that option. But if you want to be creative, don't don't um, sell yourself short of having the ability to work on micro habits that allow that creativity to be developed within you. Um, because if you don't try anything, you know, when you're painting or anything else, or in anything else for that matter, you're never going to really discover what you're capable of. So you really have to push things to the edge and try things. A lot of the times I find when people are painting, they're afraid to try things like, oh, I don't want to use too much color or I don't want to try this technique or try, just try things. And worst case scenario, if your painting isn't to your liking, well, then you can learn something for the future. I mean, I started painting 
what's today november 2nd 2021 i started painting in may or june of this year like i had painted a couple times landscape before and i hated it i don't like painting landscape i don't like the restrictions they offer i don't like the predictability don't get me wrong painting landscape is absolutely it's a uh, they're beautiful. I love looking at them. I appreciate them as arts of work. I just don't have the patience. If you look at the way that I paint with the colors that I use, I, I'm sure you can already tell I'm cert most certainly not suited for landscape um, art because in landscapes, everything is grayed down and I like bright colors. So I would not do well using, well, I mean, I, I could do it, but I wouldn't enjoy it. So anyways, I tried landscape, didn't really like it. I stopped. And then in May, I discovered uh, John Beckley, a amazing French artist um, who I had the pleasure of speaking with actually recently on Zoom. Um, I discovered him and then I saw, oh my God, abstract art can be something that I enjoy, I think. And then I started it, I started doing it and I just became addicted to how freeing it was and how the fact that you can literally do anything you want. So, but the point of this is that if you look to my first painting in May, which I should probably include it in this video. It's just dreadful. Like it's just, there's, there's no, it's like, but, but it doesn't matter. It's just there. It's never perfect. It's never, that's the thing. That's why art is so unforgiving. It's because beauty is subjective. So really you're striving to reach an ideal that in theory is not actually possible. So unless you just appreciate where you're at, and your journey of learning, then it's very hard to overcome that feeling. Um, that kind of brings me to something else I want to talk about that this other artist, I think his name is like, I don't, I've just started following him recently. He's a portrait artist, phenomenal oil painter, Alpa Fay or Alpha Pay or something. I think he's German. I'm not sure. Apologies if you're not German. Comment below. Um, <clears throat> but this guy talks about the gap which is where I feel like I'm at. The gap is a point in time that you reach as an artist where you've become good enough to see the imperfections in your work and good enough to see the perfection in other people's work that are perceivably much better than you. And it's very difficult to stomach. And a lot of times it kind of makes you want to quit because you're in the gap. Because when you're such a newbie that you're not even in the gap yet, you can't even appreciate how much better these people are than you because you don't even know what it takes to make a good composition. But when you do understand and you see how well these people apply these rules and how good they are and how well versed they are in their craft, it, it's a very, very, it can be a terrible feeling and I can relate. I, it's, I look at artists on Instagram and I just, I wanna quit every day I look at them. It's just like, I can't believe what people's hands are capable of. Um, <clears throat> so, if you're in the gap, I mean, it's kind of hard. I can't, there's no easy solution to say, but <clears throat> I guess the best advice would be just keep pressing forward one painting at a time. And surely you improve every single time your brush hits the canvas, just like anything else in life. The more time you put into something, the better the results are going to be in the long term until you become an expert. But again, an expert in this area is subjective. So, so yeah, so that actually, the perfect segue here, this section, this little triangle thing, this last fractal, I'm actually quite disappointed in myself. I don't know what you guys think about it. Be honest with me. No holds barred. You can roast me in the comments. Um, I didn't intend it to be, the thing is because I couldn't see the underpainting, I just lost sight of what I wanted to do was to just add another fractal in the center. And I just added too much glaze to a degree that you can clearly see has become too dark. Um, and then, so on the edge here, what I'm doing is I'm just creating what looks like a shadow. So it, it, it looks like this piece breaks away from the rest, but because there's too much darkness in the center, I mean, I don't know if your eyes see the same thing. You you can't see it until I take the tape off, but there just isn't enough contrast between the edge that I'm painting now and the middle because it's just as dark as the edge almost. Um, so, yeah, I just spent too much time on the glaze in the center. I That's just my person. You know, who cares? It doesn't matter. There's a building that's going on top of this anyways. You're hardly going to see it. But, um, yeah, so it just goes to show, you know, sometimes, sometimes you can't 
can't you can't be happy about everything that you do when it comes to art sometimes you're gonna wish you did this better or that better or so on and so forth big reveal yeah see there in the center it's I mean whatever it's not the end of the world you can still see the glaze obviously but the colors that are underneath aren't as apparent all right so this is the uh, this was the uh, this was long this was really this was a lot of work but you know, sure enough, the client said he enjoyed this part the most, and that would make sense given the exchange of labor that occurred. Nothing good comes easy, as they say. So this is a stencil that I bought that I had used for other things. I kind of like bricks. I really like the effects or the effect that bricks give on paintings. In this case, I used a palette knife. <clears throat> and I put a really, as you can see there, that's why I zoomed in. I wanted you to see just how much paint I'm using. I used a lot of paint. Like you can see that big blob of paint on the plate. I used probably 10 times that amount, like way, way more. I didn't realize just how much paint this would use, but <clears throat> it's really worth it if you're, you know, if you're specifically painting bricks because as the water evaporates from the acrylic, the um, mass reduces I guess yeah the mass and the volume that or the space I should say that the bricks occupy reduces so they become smaller all this to say they become smaller over time so you want to but you, you can't use too much because if you use too much it'll they can like topple over and like you know they can not they can become not bricks and just a big blob of paint which occurred a couple of times here it's a very delicate balance it happened a couple of times in this painting, so I had to stop the recording and fix everything, wipe it off. And that's the cool thing about, I mean, I guess, well, oils. I haven't really worked with oils, or not really. I haven't worked with oils at all, but even though acrylics are notorious for drying fast, if you use the right amount of paint, like, because I find a lot of people don't use enough paint, like, way too thin. If you use way too thin a layer, it dries pretty quickly, and it's tough to remove. But when you use enough paint, like you have a solid five to 10 minutes to like completely wipe it off. If you take a paper towel and you, you know, you have to spend three or five, three to five minutes to carefully wipe everything off, but it's possible. So, you know, you can always do the undo button even with acrylics to dry quickly, but you don't have that much time. You don't have like 15, 20 minutes. That's pushing it. Yeah, just happily going along here, putting my bricks down. Master brick layer. I got two shades there on the plate. I used raw umber and I think it was burnt sienna and some white, I think to mat it down or mute it rather, to mute the colors a bit. Um, so yeah, you got two different shades and I'm just randomly creating patterns of different colored bricks. And I mean, I'm pretty sure you can see there the the, oh yeah, I guess I should talk about the, the preparation part. Yeah, that's a good angle there, the zoom in. You can see all the windows, you can see the awning of the door, you can see the door, all the top of the building. Everything is stenciled out very carefully, the proportions. I spent a lot of time stencil, uh, not stenciling, uh, dr sketching, sketching the building. Proportions are super important. Um, the size of the objects with relation in relation to one another. And I guess, yeah, like we could talk about that. So <clears throat> it's pretty interesting. I learned this from this other, this guy that I was telling you about, Al Pafe, or I, I keep, I don't know what it is. I should just look at it. Anyways, uh, it talks about realism and where the illusion of realism comes from in terms of like when we look at a painting or something that's uh, presented to you in an abstract way that's me that's meant to represent something that you look at in real life like for example what I'm doing right now the building okay so realism doesn't come a lot of people think that in art realism comes from detail when in fact 
I learned this from this Alpa Fe guy that realism doesn't come from detail. Realism comes from proportions and values, light values. So as long as you have the right proportions, like for example, if you take a face or like a face would be the easiest example to relate to, right? As long as the nose is proportion, uh, well proportioned to the eyes, to the forehead, to the chin, to the cheeks, to everything, as long as that's the case, what shade of color or what hue the nose actually is doesn't or no sorry the as long as the, the proportions are are correct you can tell that it's a nose right but then to add to the realism if you want to add depth to that that'll just show you a two-dimensional face right like okay great i know that this is a face when it's sketched out and the proportions are correct but it doesn't show you the depth right the illusion of depth the illusion of depth comes from the values that you use the light and dark values which the artist will represent sometimes using different colors, which sometimes you'll see these like bright, beautiful portrait paintings, which you ask yourself, how was this artist able to represent a face using greens and blues and pinks? It's because they're using the right values. So in areas of the face that's dark, where there's a lot of shading and, and a shadow, for example, they'll use a, uh, a color that is darker in value, whether it be, it doesn't matter what the hue is, as long as it's darker in proportion to the other colors on the painting, then you'll have the illusion of realism. So it's important to know from this, the takeaway is that realism doesn't come from detail. So you don't have to spend 50 hours detailing a painting. In fact, a lot of artists I find stray away from hyper realism over time because it becomes more interesting to represent things in more abstract ways with more bold brush strokes and so because it allows for more interpretation for you to tell a, a story that people can interpret in different ways rather than look at this exact replica of this photo which of course is is a skill and a, a testament to the patience it takes to do that but in terms of the liberty that it provides when you're creating it doesn't provide any but when you push the envelope and try to use these different colors or more bold brush strokes you can still convey realism while not focusing on detail while just making sure proportions are correct and values are correct so the way that this relates to this building is my values are correct in terms of okay those look like brick colors i've got two shades of them so it kind of looks like there's you know, to, there's basically light hitting them at different angles, or of course, sometimes colors are different bricks, but it doesn't matter when your eyes look at those, you can see, okay, there's different colors. That's something I've already seen before. They look like bricks, right? And the other thing is the proportion. So in relation to one another, they're all, um, they're all level, right? And they're all perfectly in line with one another. Now, the comparison here with the face is that let's say that one of just one of the rows of these bricks was off. It wasn't level, it was off center, it doesn't matter. Right away, it would distort the whole image and the the more mistakes, quote unquote, you will, uh, if you will, that you make in this sense, the less accurate your representation is. But when you look at the detail on these bricks, there aren't any details. It's there's no detail whatsoever they're just blobs of paint in a stencil right so again you can the point is proven that realism doesn't come from detail in this painting because you'll still be able to clearly see this is a brick building after and you'll see there'll be windows there'll be a door there'll be window sills there'll be all sorts of elements that you can see that have absolutely no detail but the proportions are correct and the values are correct so um, yeah, as long as those things are present, you can convey realism. And then I think, again, it's important to understand that because it really allows you to take your art to the next level because you can create so much more freely because people are just so stuck on detail and they always think, oh, no, I can't do X, Y or Z in art because it requires so much detail and it would take me a thousand hours to complete. Um, but you don't, it's not necessarily the case. I mean, sometimes it can be and is the case, but it doesn't have to always be the case. You can represent things in an abstract way, very accurately to a degree where people can quickly identify what it is that they're looking at. Even a particular face of a person, you know, like a famous art or a famous personality, uh, celebrity or something that someone paints in an abstract way. So I got the tape going there. <clears throat> I mean, I realized just a lot easier to, 
and not have to mess around with the edges and potentially get paint in places that I don't want it to be. So I'm just using the roll of tape there to hold the stencil down. I'm sure you figured that out. Yeah, I really enjoyed, I've been painting a lot with the palette knife lately. I mean, this is a particular type of exercise with the stencil and everything, but Generally speaking, I've been painting a lot with the palette knife and I really like the um, effect that it gives when you're just using it freely on the canvas. Really neat. Yeah, so I think I sped this clip up to like, I think it was, uh, yeah, it was a thousand percent. So, how long do the bricks here? It's like what? Plus there's a lot of cut footage. I'm just trying to figure out how much I spent. I, I don't know how, how much I spent on, how much time I spent on that, but it was very time consuming. It took a lot, a lot longer than I thought it would. But in the end, like I said, it was definitely worth it. In fact, the fourth piece I did, this is two of four. The fourth piece I did, which I just completed a couple days ago and is being delivered to the client tomorrow. Um, I also did the same thing because he asked specifically for bricks. Actually, that it's funny. I, I made a play on the, the brick request. I put three layers of bricks in the underpainting and uh, with the building itself. So I'll do a video on that one too at some point. So yeah, you want to make sure that uh, you have enough paint for your project, of course. I r ran out of burnt sienna, which was one of the colors I used for the bricks, as I laid the very last brick down. I remember telling the client, like, oh, I don't know if I'll have it done for today. Not, not that there was any particular rush, but I was telling him I'd have it done by a specific day. And uh, I said, I'm not sure if I'll be done that day because I'm running low on this paint but then I did some calculating in my mind and I thought okay I think I'll be okay and worst case I can mix a different color and make up for it but we made it we made it with the burnt sienna last brick was laid So yeah, I highly suggest you uh, try abstract. I mean, I'm assuming if you're still watching the video here, you're probably interested in doing so. Um, it's so much fun. It's very liberating. It's definitely pseudo therapy in terms of just getting in focus and getting in the zone of creativity in what they call flow state. It's uh, yeah, a lot of fun, very freeing. And then as you get better and you learn the things that I was talking about, composition and color values and saturation and what colors mix well together and you, you get better with color mixing and to represent things more accurately, it just becomes that much more intoxicating as people tell you, hey, that's a really cool painting. It becomes, uh, yeah, becomes very addictive. It's a lot of fun. Almost at the finish line for these brown bricks, guys. Yeah, and I guess from a mindset perspective, there's a lot of, um, it, because art is so subjective and there's a lot of like arrogance and pompousness, I don't even know if that's a word. If it's not, it should be. Um, in the 
domain of art. And there's a lot of reasons I find, a lot of cultural reasons why this exists. You know, the old artist's notion that there's a lot of investment that goes into becoming a good artist. <clears throat> a lot of courses that they used to take. And I think that some people are trying to hold on to that because that's what distinguishes them and makes them unique. And of course, who doesn't want to be unique, especially when you're a creative? That's literally the whole point of being creative. But the thing is now with the, ac the advent of the internet and access to all of this, there's an overload of information. There's not just enough of it. There's an overload of information. Uh, anybody can get good at pretty much anything, literally anything in the world. You could Google it, go on YouTube and find a ton of content on virtually any subject in the world that you want to improve on. So I think that's the, the thing that allows people to be self-taught even more so than they ever used to be. Um, and this kind of bothers some people. So they'll quickly jump in and say, oh, this isn't good, or you need to work on that, and you need to do this. And I would say, be aware of your own progress. Don't delude yourself into thinking that you're better than you are, but also don't delete yourself into thinking that you're worse than you are. Because if you're just starting something else, of course, you're going to be bad at it. You're not, you know, it's all, it's not like, oh, that's really good. Keep it's no, it's bad. And it's okay that it's bad because if everything is good, then there's that good has no value. If everything is good, right? So a lot of people try to encourage you in the wrong way. Well, I'm not saying it's wrong. Of course, they'll try to be encouraging, but it's not helpful to tell someone something is good when really you don't think it is. And of course it's subjective. So sometimes somebody might not like something, but if you yourself can tell something isn't good, that's okay. Cause not everything you're going to make is good and you're not going to like everything you make and that's okay. And you just have to accept that as part of the journey, because if you stop there, then you're never going to get to the point where you create anything you like. But I promise you, if you continue, you will come to a point where you're like, wow, this is really cool. I like what I've done here. So don't pay attention to all the all the pompous, arrogant comments about don't do this or don't paint or don't try or just tune it all out. Just put the brush on the canvas and just paint. The rest falls into place. So again, it's like everything else. You want to become a good gymnast? Well, you're not going to go to the gym and do a triple sow cow. Oh, no, that's a thing. That's a figure skating move. Anyways, you're not going to do, do a pirouette of complex nature until you're very well versed in the subject so painting is no different art is no different anything creative especially it's very difficult to create something all right so we're done the bricks i let the layers dry as you can see they kind of dry darker acrylics tend to dry darker um yeah, so there I'm just using a palette knife to delic delicately lay down the under, I don't know, it's, yeah, it's the under part of the awning. I don't know exactly what it's called, but yeah. So again, what I'm focusing on here is not detail, it's proportions and size, right? So I'm being very delicate with the knife to make sure that I'm following the lines that I've um, that I've sketched because I know that if I follow those lines, I'm going to be able to accurately represent the object I'm trying to represent because this is because the proportions are correct. There's no detail on that awning, right? It doesn't there doesn't have to be because it's gonna although it's gonna be perfectly um, straight and in line with where I want it to be. So the proportions and the values the light values are going to be correct so you're going to be your eyes are going to be able to quickly tell oh that's an awning so it doesn't have to do with detail again the realism and yeah there's different ways of conveying realism that's the beauty of art is there's many different ways of conveying realism So this is the top here. I have to be very, very delicate here because it goes on an angle and then it tapers off at the end. So I have to drag the knife and make a sharp, clean edge while dragging paint. As long as I do that successfully, it doesn't matter what the 
blob of paint looks like, it's going to look like an awning. Right now it's just a blob of paint, but as I carefully lay it out in the sketch, it's going to look like exactly what I want it to. By the way, it's upside down right now. I don't know if you could tell, but yeah, the bottom is at the top. The bottom of the building's at the top. You can see there, yeah, there you go. So now I'm doing the roof. Same thing here, you can see there's these panels. So the perspective that we're looking at from the building is if we're standing at the very base of the building and we're kind of looking up at the, the roof there. So you can see this is the side of the building where the roof contours the building. So I'm being very careful. I've got two shades of color there because the reference photo had two shades of these panels. And because of the perspective from which we are looking, as you move towards the front, as the panels approach you, they become larger. So I'm being very delicate, again, with my proportions. So as long as I'm using the right proportions, and in this case, the values don't even matter as much because um, it's not a face. It's not a, like values are important for, for Lansing, but when it comes to buildings, because, well, I guess it faces to be the same thing, depending on where you are, if it's a brightly lit room or not brightly lit room. But anyways, the point is the, the values themselves and the colors I'm using here don't matter as much as the proportions and the breakup of each piece and the size of each piece with relation to one another as you start to come forward. So that's, that's where the realism comes in here. That's why I'm being very delicate with one piece being slightly larger than the next and then making a nice divide between them so that it conveys the illusion of an object that's getting closer to you or objects that are getting closer to you. So I'm gonna speed this one up. I just wanted to slow it down a bit so you guys could really see how attentive how careful I'm being is it again just if you're trying to convey an effect of realism then those things are what's going to help you achieve that so that's that's the beauty of a palette knife is that you don't necessarily need the detail to convey the realism So as much as there are no rules in abstract, I mean, in art in general, there are definitely rules or rather in, in, in composition, there are definitely rules. I'm, I would say, um, I, or I'd, I would encourage you to educate yourself on composition in general, because composition applies to all forms of art, photography, or basically all forms of actually, no, you know, music too. music, you have to think about the composition as well, right? Uh, the overall piece and how it sounds. So I would encourage you to educate yourself on um, composition. And uh, again, as much as there are no rules in abstract, you can do so many things. There are still rules in composition that you can break them, but you have to break them strategically and methodically and have a specific aim in mind. Otherwise, I can guarantee you, just like my first pieces were in abstract, where I had absolutely no plan, they're going to come out terrible, but that's okay. You have to go through that learning curve, and that's how you're gonna realize how important composition is. When you make a piece that's really bad, and you thought you had a plan, and really you didn't, you just, well, this is the best you could do at the time. It's just going, you're going to get that much better. Um, but, yeah, I would say definitely educate yourself on composition so that you can learn what makes a good... I mean, I've talked about it in, in as an overview with proportions, perspective also. Perspective is an, uh, another thing. And actually, this roof here is a good example of perspective. So I guess proportions, perspective, and values for composition. The perspective that I'm looking up... So as you can see, these pieces of the panels... They're angled from the very edge of the building. They're at their most sharp angle 
to right now in the very center, they're straight. Cause it's, if you were looking, if, you, if your body would be centered at the very base of the building in the middle and you're looking up at it. So as you turn your head to look left, the panels would look as if they're tilting to the left. And if you, as you look right, the panels would look increasingly as though they're tilting to the right. So I'm being very mindful here again, to convey the realism has nothing to do with the detail or the colors that I'm using. I could have used blues and oranges there. It wouldn't have mattered. You've never seen a blue and orange roof, but you still would have known it's a roof based on the perspective that I'm showing you with the angle of each panel and being very careful that each panel, I think you can see there from the, the two colors that each panel looks like it's increasingly more tilted in its direction. And then you'll see at the, when I'm done laying those panels down, I'm actually going to go over it again with the knife just to even, just to more sharply define each line in between the panels. Right here, I think, yeah. Just going in between and just cutting and then wiping the excess paint to get a clean cut. And then every time I apply the knife, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm, see, I'm just making sure, oh, this one's a little less tilted. Oh, just got to make sure everything is correct. And then in that case, as long as that's correct, the detail doesn't matter. It's all about perspective and proportion. So now just doing the first half of the top of the roof. There's a second layer that I'm putting there with the other uh, layer of tape. They're just two slightly different shades of gray. Um, I guess I should say it's worth mentioning that different pigments have different um, different pigments are some pigments are softer than others and more liquidy than others even though they're supposed to be the same consistency it's all about nature these pigments that they use they're either synthesized in a lab or found in nature so they'll all behave slightly differently and interact slightly differently with your tools so i noticed that the gray that i was using the the grays generally speaking were a lot more liquidy so when i was laying the brick down for the uh, the entrance it wasn't they weren't laying down as well as the brown so that's something I learned about that pigment specifically. So if it's, I know it's a particular point, but it's worth mentioning if ever you encounter something where you wonder why some pigments are a lot more fluid than others, even within the same brands. All right, so we're almost done here. The top layer or the top part of the roof. It's a slightly, I think it's a darker shade of gray there. And palette knife allows for a cool, so that, actually that's one thing I wanna mention about the, the palette knife. So the cool thing about a palette knife is that because of the texture that it creates with the paint, you, have, you can actually have the illusion of different colors within the same color itself because of the texture and the light in the room reflecting off of the different surfaces within the same color. So you, you, like you can see there, the, like you'll have different darker shades of gray. So it, it'll give the illusion of an uneven surface like a brick or cement or something like that. Um, so it's really cool because without mixing a different color, you'll have the semblance of different values within the same color just based on the texture that the palette knife leaves and that's also what happens with the brick so if you look at the brick there's a lot of dark areas on the brick but i used only two colors and that's because of the relief that i've created with the palette knife so that's one thing i wanted to mention about the palette knife it's super cool for that reason it really adds another element another layer to your painting Right, there's a lot of light there it's too bad i wanted to anyways you'll see it at some point the effect of the roof and the panels and 
So right now I'm just glazing some blues on the windows. Oh, there you go. You can kind of see the roof there, even though it's dark. Glazing some blues on the windows. Now I'm getting the door in there. <clears throat> I used a filbert brush here, but in hindsight, I have no idea why I used a filbert. I should have used a flat brush for the corners. It's pretty, pretty stupid of me. Pretty, actually, I should say, thoughtless. I mean, I still got it done, but in any case, should use the flat brush. why I should have used a flat brush. I wouldn't have had to struggle so much with the edges. It would have been so much easier. All right, so now I'm getting the plate, whatever that's called, for the address. Didn't record myself doing the address. It took a couple seconds, but either way, you'll see it on the finished product. I think it was 221. I used metallic gold for that. So there I'm just, here I'm just putting, so you can see the windows now are darker, so you can really see the roof there, how, how well it came out. You see the different shades of color. I mean, it's upside down, so, I mean, but still, you can see the different angles and the perspective. So there I'm just putting the borders of the windows in a very abstract fashion in terms of using the palette knife, and you see the uneven edges, but again, when you're trying to convey realism, you don't have to focus on detail, because if you focused on that detail, you'd say, I don't know what company built those windows, but I'm not buying. That's the cool thing about abstract, you know, with a palette knife. I like the character that it gives to the painting. I like the uneven edges and the, the uneven lines, the crookedness, if you will. I enjoy that. I think it's nice. So uh, if you enjoy this video, there's a couple minutes left, but if you enjoyed the video, I would appreciate if you subscribed and liked the video. Comment if you have anything to say, if you want something to be shown or talked about, or if you have any questions, if you found it helpful. Um, I'm trying to figure out the best way to deliver the content in terms of whether I should do a time lapse with a voiceover or no voiceover or full length with a voiceover. I'm not sure what people would prefer or what people would be engaged with more. Um, I just find there's not a lot of good tutorials or free tutorials for that matter for abstract specifically. So I feel like there's a need for this or these types of videos with a voiceover. Um, but yeah, comment below if you have any questions or if you'd like to see something particular. Just getting those, the, uh, that concrete there, the, I don't know what that's called, but it's under the windows. Small slab of concrete. So you can see the door is completed. The windows are completed. I've just got, I've just got the bottom of the base. Oh yeah, the base of the building is done. Yep. Yeah, so here, this is something I like doing with my paintings. I like putting like cool borders around them. Just like do different things. Sometimes they connect, sometimes they don't. You can have fun with it. Just put tape down. I use the palette knife to give the border some texture and to make it look like it's sticking out. It kind of just like, kind of looks like a mini, not like a mini frame, but it kind of looks like a pseudo frame, I should say. I use that word twice in the video, pseudo. Kind of looks like a frame around a painting without really having a frame. And I really like the silver against the blue and those colors and the gold too. I love those two. They're metallic silver, metallic gold. I love those two colors. I'm obsessed with metallic gold and silver. Anything shiny. I don't know why. I just can't get enough of shiny. Um, so yeah. You can see there it's starting to shape up. Take the tape off. Got a nice clean 
metallic gold border and metallic silver and that's it guys we're almost done thanks for watching I really appreciate the support and I, re I appreciate you sticking around till the end and uh, we'll see you next time. Hopefully you enjoyed it and found it helpful. And hopefully it helps on your journey to becoming an improved abstract artist.